I'm so, so happy to have you here in person now. It's for me uh, really exciting because it's uh, the first talk I'm, I'm giving after one and a half years and uh, with such a great panel and with you here and also with the great audience, which is hopefully looking now at the video online. Thank you so much. And I would really like to encourage everyone that we have got an, a vivid conversation. So we tried in the beginning to have this a bit uh, different concept-wise. So we wanted to go in the audience and the audience is coming here. But then on the other hand, we said, okay, with corona restrictions, we cannot do this now. So maybe we still can somehow find the way that we can all engage and also take part in on this topic. I'm Corina, and I'm part of Fashion Revolution Germany and also um, part of the Fashion Open Studio team. And I'm very, very looking uh, much forward to the talk about revolution. Will technology save us? And um, if we look in history, what has changed with technology, you can also ask the question if technology caused the problems which we are facing right now. But today, we want to get inspired by these people here who actually use advantages of the modern technology to help changing the way we look at fashion. And before we start, I want to quickly or, um, introduce our speakers here. So on my left is Ursula de Castro, co-founder uh, from the Fashion Revolution campaign, the world's largest fashion activism movement, which is driving by, driven by digital social media actions linked with offline events. It's happening right now in over 90 countries. She's also the author of the book Loft Clothes Last, and I don't know of how many other things <laughs> which she initiated. Um, and the second speaker is Sophie Tendai Christians. She's the advisory board member of Fashion Revolution Zimbabwe, and that's how she came here, because we are linked to each other, and then we found out that she is incidentally in Berlin, and we asked her to be part of our panel. She's the co-founder of Soon Africa, the circular and regenerative design and education center in Africa. And on uh, besides her is Dr. Monica Haug. She's the founder of Repair Rebels, a digital uh, craft startup. And with her venture, she wants to make fashion repairs as easy as online shopping. And next to her, last but not least, I would like to introduce Dr. Carsten Pufal. He is a postdoctoral researcher and project leader at the Institute of Optics and Atomics Physics at Technical University Berlin. So for each of our speakers, technology plays an important role in their daily work. And I'm really curious to know more about how this is working. Ursula, when you started the Fashion Revolution campaign, were you aware of the power you could un unleash with the global fashion activism and um, the digitalization through the social media? <laughs> in really, no. So I'm a crochet lady, you know, <laughs> and I make clothes and, and everything for me was about hands and technology. I, I, I probably even refrained from pressing buttons <laughs> at the time. But <clears throat> social media, um, I was always curious. I diarized it. It's a way of communicating and I am an arch communicator. And so when Fashion Revolution started, uh, we knew that obviously we had to get in with the times and stop being so granny <laughs> and just get in with, with, with technology. It was weird. I mean, there was like a room full of adults and we were discussing hashtags. <laughs> you know, it felt a little bit like Monty Python. But nevertheless, for us, social media was 100% what drove us as an organization. And I have to say that everything that we've done has been this mixture between very instinctive, very old, very felt, but married with what we can use right now. We couldn't run a, you know, 90 team uh, organization if we weren't connected with, you know, buttons and waves. Um, we couldn't get the information from our followers if that's not how we were communicating. The Fashion Transparency Index is all mixing ancient you know, instincts with very modern technology. So for us, it's been pivotal. And 
I'm sure we'll talk about it later, but I think that it has a huge role in bringing back things that potentially we may think we have forgotten, and technology will be a new way of remembering that we know them. Wow, yeah. That's also what I, I so much appreciate about the Fashion Revolution campaign, that it links people from all over the globe. It doesn't matter where you go. If you go in a country, you have a look online, where is there the, the head of uh, Fashion Revolution, and then you're in the scene already. It's amazing how this power uh, has a, such a power and also gives a face to the workers you know, behind the, the products. It's through social media it's possible that we link each other to yeah. together. And that's how, as I said already before, that's how Sophie joined here. And um, my question is to you now. Um, how are you connected to con technology? Can technology transform societies to become more sustainable? What do you think? Um, I mean, I'm an optimist, hopefully. Um, we were talking about optimism and pessimism <laughs> earlier. But I also think that boils down to what we perceive technology is and how we define it. And um, if you kind of deduce it to the simplest definition of the term of it being a way to use different knowledge systems to create a, solve, create a solution to a problem, um, then yes, um, and I speak purely from my context, which is Zimbabwe, um, I refrain from speaking about Africa as a monolith because it's not, but um, we, 60% of the world is still offline right now. So digital technology, specifically from my context, it, they are very useful to some people, but not to everybody. Um, and biotech and different types of technologies are also not accessible to the whole population. But then if you look at what's happening on the ground in communities, I mean, there's a huge circular movement of, okay, how do we make products circular? How do we make things regenerative? Um, how do we upcycle, how do we recycle, and how do we go beyond that? And um, there's a lot of communities that have been doing these knowledge, that have been doing these practices for years um, for different reasons, one of them being poverty, one of them being that they've just learned it from their grandmother, who's learned it from their grandmother, who's learned it from their grandmother, and they know how to regenerate items. Um, so the concept of waste is minimal, and if we start looking at technologies or those knowledge systems as technologies, then for sure, I, I definitely think that it's a way forward. But we can't dismiss them as technologies purely because they're not coming from a mechanized process, or they're not coming from an industrialized process, or they're not coming from a formal education system. They're coming from communities that are sustaining themselves on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so if we can kind of reconceptualize how we look at technology, um, I think that's a way to make it more inclusive, and I think that's a very, it's a huge way forward. Um, and that's where my optimism comes from in that sense. So, I mean, for now I say yes, but purely from that perspective. And, and this is the Fashion Revolution campa campaign helping you in that, the community is around? It is. It's connected us with a lot of designers that do have access to digital platforms. Um, specifically Instagram, which has been a whirlwind for a lot of businesses. Um, and these businesses are connected to the local communities. Um, so in that sense, we learn through different brands, like um, I'm sure a lot of Zimbabweans in the audience will recognize, like House of Stone. She, uh, Denai, Denai is a great designer, and she works with traditional forms of creating things, and she works with local communities, and she connects those systems together. Um, and we know her through Fashion Revolution um, because she's a part of Fashion Revolution. So it's connected us to those systems too, um, even though a lot of the communities that have con connected us through Fashion Revolution aren't necessarily online. Um, so it's, it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. And Monica, you have set up digi a digital platform, Repair Rebels, which helps to connect also the people. And uh, at Repair Rebels, you can order your clothing repairs online and make it as easy as online shopping experience. How do you want to achieve this? And in which, in which uh, point are you right now? So maybe taking one step back, uh, the reason why we decided to find Repair Rebels was really because we realized that fashion industry doesn't use technology that much, right? 
I think we have to admit that there are more people on the planet who have cell phones but don't have access to sanitation. We are at the stage where we are exploiting or exploring space travel, but we're still producing clothes the way we were doing 100 years ago, right? 100%. Um, so I think technology has always been there, but fashion industry was just not using it um, in the way maybe it could have been doing it, right? And uh, being part of fashion revolution movement, uh, I'm representing Dusseldorf for over four years already. Um, so really being part of this family, this huge family, um, and I think also thanks to Oshola and uh, and carry. Um, so I think it was not the technology which made the movement spread around. It was really the business model you took, because you were really open about it, right? You put all the resources online. And I remember the way we started in Dusseldorf. It was my friend who was a banker, and me <laughs> still a researcher, and we were like, okay, let's put Fashion Revolution event together. And we're like, okay, let's design a poster. How do we design a poster? <laughs> And of course, it was fantastic because you had all the re resources there, digital resources there. We could just take it, download it, and use it. And that made a lot of things more easy. And I think this approach, the open source approach, was the number one reason why the movement spread around so fast. Of course, it was facilitated by technology. So one thing to Fashion Revolution, uh, really being inspired and taken by that movement, um, I realized that fashion industry is really lacking behind when it comes to innovation. And really looking at the repair industry, you could really see that the repair industry is one of the few industries which are completely not digital. So they are run, the, re, the local repair shops are run by immigrant people who don't even use emails, uh, who are hard to find on Google, uh, who don't even have a website. And like Oshola says, the most sustainable garment is the one that you already own. I truly believe and live this, um, this um, uh, ethos, right? But it's so difficult to repair clothing, right? Um, if you haven't learned that at school, if you don't have a grandma or your mom who could do it for you, right? Uh, and you're living a busy modern life, it's way easier to buy something new. First of all, it's very cheap to buy new but also it is very, very easy to buy new. And this is our motivation. It came, we said, we want to make repairing clothes as easy as buying new, because only so we can motivate people to repair more. It's a big ambition, uh, because like I said, we are fighting two wars, one on the consumer side, you know, trying to set, tell them, okay, even if it's so easy and so cheap to buy new, maybe it's better to repair which is hard to con co convince the consumers. And still we have a lot of people who go on our platform and they open their eyes like, are you serious to charge these prices? I was like, hello, we are in Germany, it takes two hours to repair your garment. And they, oh, okay. On the other side, another war, like I mentioned, is really the local repair shops uh, because you know, they are not digital. You know, those people are scared of internet and they don't want to do anything. They don't want to have to do anything with internet. So you really need to teach them and you know, you really need to go with them, talk to them, explain them and, and take them with you. Uh, but it's a great job. I think it's really worth pushing it. Um, and we're learning every day uh, because there's still a lot to learn in this market. And this drives us. Yeah, amazing. So, um, Everyone in Düsseldorf can um, use the platform, or how is it built? Is it an app also linked to that, or is this future music? We don't. Uh, you're not at this stage right now. So we are actually this week testing our prototype. We are already taking repairs over WhatsApp. So a lot of people contact us over social media, over WhatsApp, and we are launching in Düsseldorf, and we are planning to go to all the bigger German cities. Um, because, I mean, amazing. It, it, <laughs> you need to scale the solution. Um, and I think our ambition is to build a case for Dusseldorf, an efficient repair city, um, and then, you know, replicate it in other locations. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. 
Yeah, so we have uh, the repair topic on the one hand, and on the other hand, we have all the material which is already existing on the planet. And now I want to uh, zoom a bit in and go uh, more into the direction of R&D and textiles. Carsten, in your current research, you are focusing on sorting methods for closed-loop textile recycling, and for example, by artificial intelligence. What change can we expect in the near future to happen in technology and innovation? Mm, big question, I would say. <laughs> you never want, as a researcher, you never want to overpromise. So, mm. but um, I think we're facing, like at least in the EU, it's in, in four years there's going to be a big wave of textiles coming in, mm. uh, and on the waste side because there's a new EU directive. So, and hopefully um, these collecting textiles, which has been a very German discipline, so it's not very <laughs> common in, uh, in the EU. So, like we have like 65% collection rate in Germany and like 20 or 30% in the EU. So that will hopefully change, but there will also has to, the information, uh, the, the industry has to transform because uh, this, like right now it's about picking the best parts of that huge waste stream and selling it on, as second hand and exporting or shreddering the rest and putting it into car seats and into wiping cloth. But once you have more of these, this whole business model has to change because the, text, the second-hand market cannot uptake all that, that, uh, all that many garments. So we, we have two pr sub-projects we're facing on. So one faces on that um, second-hand part that means uh, using artificial intelligence. I know that's a big topic, it's a big name. So it's computer vision. We're trying to implement methods that um, yeah, analyze or analyze textiles or garments and um, have finding a more objective uh, way to, to sort them into fine, very fine grain categories so that we can finally or hopefully um, I'll advertise them to very specific customer groups. So now it's so it's not only about brands, but also about let that I don't know not only wedding dresses, but like floral dresses or certain types of T-shirts. So many more categories that you could sort by hand. So that's one project, and the other project is uh, that takes care of the textile waste, so something that cannot be reused again. And there we're using spectroscopic methods to to find out the material compositions of, uh, of garments to find the suitable recycling channels because unfortunately the, all these polymers that are used, you cannot mix them, they don't mix, so you have to put them into different fractions before you can finally make use fiber to fiber recycling which has very high restrictions on, what, on the feedstock to make new, garn, new, sorry, new yarn out of it which you can then use for yeah, new garments. Mm -hmm. So that sounds really interesting. Is, um, is, is the question is also, how can we use it? No? How is the system developing? Because we have so much uh, waste, so much material, and the people, they, they need to change also their behavior, I think. Um, are you positive about um, the future in this uh, direction, that, we can, that these technologies can help us to, to solve the problems which we have? Mm. <laughs> not sure, not sure. Yeah. So uh, at least I can say that technology alone will not do it. So, so that's, uh, when I first read the title that you sent me, there's like, is technology going to save us? It was immediately, going, no, it's not going to save us, for sure not. <laughs> because, it, as you said, technology brought us all these problems of exploiting resources, exploiting the, panel, uh, the planet, and uh, in the first place. So it, it has been the tool to do all this. So why should it just turn around and do the opposite now? So that's, I think that's unrealistic. But um, so the technology is, I think it's a tool that society or civil society can use and we can make good use out of it and we can make bad use of it. That doesn't mean that there's technology is always neutral. I mean, there's definitely bad technology and there's technology that has a bad purpose in mind, but uh, it's up to society how to make use of it. And so that's where the campaigns like these come into place. And uh, well, I think the overall consumption has to go down. It's, it's, it's not only that recycling, once we have this 
the circularity system and then we can consume as much as we want, that's not going to happen. Never going to happen. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I really couldn't agree more. So there is this kind of panacea that, you know, everything will be recycled at some point. But anything that is born of excess will have a massive, imp you know, footprint. So it is really about slowing down first. And then, I mean, for me, technology is, again, we invented it. So why should it save us or put us into further danger in many ways, but there is, there is a risk that we inject things that we don't really understand, and so we don't really know how we will be saved or maimed by it. So for me, technology, what's interesting right now is that that connect, connects us to who we are. You know, it, uh, when I speak about the Fashion Transparency Index, this idea of having traceability 50 years ago, 60 years ago, these were connections we made without the use of technology. I mean, we knew that, you know, if you bought a pair of Converse, they had to be made in the USA, or they weren't Converse. And same with wool coming from Italy and tailoring, though, being in the UK. So this understanding of our supply chain, it's something that we've lost. We've gigantified. And technology, in many ways, is going to help us to map it but it's nevertheless our curiosity that needs to create that map and the reason for that map to be in existence. However, going back to, mm -hmm. to Monica, and we could be on a repair, you know, love <laughs> fest here for you know, a good few days, mm -hmm. but this is what interests me, to use technology in ways that, you know, they make us remember things that we already knew. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, I feel that we can really uh, make big changes with, with, with small art, but always with the understanding that it's, it's something that we need to tailor to us and tailor to a good use rather than a negative use because it's so plain that we've, we've done them both. And I've been, uh, you know, in, in this, particularly this repair conversation, I've been begging every single fast fashion store to put cheap and affordable repair stations in those stores. So anyone that's watched a, a talk of mine will know I'm doing it again. Primark, Zalando, Boohoo, uh, Topshop's gone, but H&M, Zara, repair stations in your stores available as affordable as the cheap clothes that they produce. But that's just the end. At the very beginning, it's slowing down and paying your workers and respecting the supply chain. Yeah, yeah. But that's really about changing the business model. Of right? course. It's really, it's not about technology, it's really about the business model. The same thing with transparency. You know, it, it, we need fashion brands to want to be transparent, right? Yep. The fashion industry is a very secretive industry. I met so many even sustainable fashion brands here at, at the fairs a few years ago who would not like to tell me where are they producing because they are scared or other reasons, right? So really the industry needs to want it. And then we can use technology, uh, which can be a powerful tool. Um, the same with, re with repairs. I mean, the industry doesn't want that. I mean, <laughs> we've been approaching social media influencers <laughs> asking to support a campaign and we've been told very honestly, we are living from selling, not from repairing. You know, so that's really, you know, we are against the classical business model. Absolutely. And in fact, I recently put a post on Instagram, probably the one that was the most controversial of anything I've ever done. But so for me, when people say I support, you know, garment workers, but their product is shit and fast fashion, you might as well just throw it in the bin. This has been one of the most dangerous narratives that we've been, you know, perpetrating for the last 25 years and disrespectful to the people who make our clothes. The fashion, uh, fast fashion brands have been swimming in joy each time we say don't repair. And at the end of the day, everything ought to be repairable. And, you know, it again, it goes back to knowledge. And technology can help us with that knowledge. I mean, I tell everybody, whenever you buy something, turn it around, pull any string that's, uh, you know, falling apart. And, and see how products are being made. And I do believe that, you know, that the really 
showing and leading by example and making repair um, available everywhere is, is really, um, you know, very important, as is learning from those places in the world that haven't lost it. Because in India, for instance, in Africa, in, again, I'm sorry, I'm speaking, generalizing here, in Southeast Asia, the, the, the mending is, is still, you know, really autochthonous to the communities. And it's us that have lost it and need to technologize it back into our lives. Mm. Yeah, and also, Going back to the beginning, because like you said, rep repairing is an important part of the process, but looking at the beginning of that process and being like, I mean, you see a lot of brands right now where recycling and upcycling and all the bicycle form of restoration is, has become their brand. So it's, you know, we upcycle, we do this, which is great, but it's one part of the problem and we have to look at, okay, well, how do we move towards an ecosystem in a way where we don't need to recycle, we don't need to upcycle, or that becomes inherent, where waste isn't the predominant issue, but it's just a part of our ecosystem. We hear over and over, waste is a design flaw. Mm. But we can keep saying this, and we can keep saying this, but if we don't start using technology, or we don't start adapting our design process in a way where we constantly have to figure out new ways to recycle, as opposed to knowing what that recycling process is going to be, when we design the product in the first place, then it's going to be a very long road. So that's just something that we need to inherently start focusing on too, is how do we start from the beginning? How do we design products? How do we innovate products where planned obsolescence isn't inevitable? Like, it's mm. not inevitable. It's not going to automatically become a waste product in 20 years or 30 years, even if it is a or durable item. Or five minutes. Or five minutes, exactly. So that's also an important part of the solution and things that we need to start thinking about. Or by the time you, know, you sell something, I think it's really extended producer responsibility. Mm -hmm. Because again, the industry was built so sell as much as possible, produce as cheap as possible. Once you sold it, then you tell the consumer that you should feel bad two months later that you don't have the new thing, and then again sell as much as possible and make the consumer feel bad about it. So once the brands will be responsible for what happens with the products, once they will be maybe even taxed for producing waste which don't uh, decay for years, um, then we're going to have a change. So really the, the business logic needs to change and it's a very harsh change. Um, I think for this reason we see when we talk about innovation in the fashion industry that it doesn't come from the fashion brands, it comes from outsiders, you know? It's <laughs> all from emerging brands. Emerging brands, but you know, not, um, not, not the typical fashion players, because you know, it, it's hard. I mean, um, we really need to change the game. Mm. Yeah, I yeah. think I'd like to step in with the, um, at the point of repairs, and I think like, it, it, if you compare like all other technology that you have, you buy it and you have a warranty, and if that, if it has a design flaw, that company pays for it. So maybe you need that repair store because that then if a product has been made in a way that it falls apart after half a half a year, then um, that company has that feedback that this product has been bad, and because now they can just push it into the market and it's gone, and they don't have to care. And how long it's going to last and how it can be recycled, all these things are just out of the scope. It, there's no incentive to do it, so I think... And that there is actually less transparency on that side of the supply chain than there is, I mean, you know, at least some steps have been done with the Fashion Transparency Index. When it comes to products and the way that they end up, technologically there was a program in Italy that actually put a microchip in second-hand clothing to see, to try and analyze actually what happens to secondhand clothing. And, you know, the reality was that half went the usual way, so the secondhand store and then being sold, but a great half went through the mafia and were littered in south of Italy, you know, without any form of regulation whatsoever. And, you know, we, we, we really struggle to follow the case of the clothes once we throw them. That's why I think, you know, the, the, the technology 
particularly in this case, we need to think about longevity, what we can actually do as people before we rely on, on, the, on the kind of technological. Yeah, and that's yeah. also about raising awareness, no? the, the, what the Fashion Revolution campaign and through also the digital media that is possible right now, that we can share this knowledge and everyone everywhere in the world can read it. Yeah. I, would I had, I had yeah. one uh, question to Karsten. Uh, how much of the sorting is being done by hand and by the machines? All of it is done by hand. Okay. So, so far? Yeah. There is no, there is no channel that brings it reliably to mm. fiber to fiber recycling because it just that whole that business whole business model is not yet set up. Mm. So this will evolve over the next years. So, but so far everything that you throw in the container is taken by by humans and then sorted into different fractions. Mm. The waste has been taken out because there's a lot of waste in it, mm. and it's all human labor. When do you think it's going to change, or are will, they? Enough it will, technology? It, uh, I always say that we were planning on a semi-automatic system, so it will always involve humans because that is like a textile is from from the from the morphology is it's not no machine can so far unfold it, and it's just very difficult. And humans are quite good in unfolding and <laughs> looking at textiles, and they can say, hey, okay, this this smells a bit bad. This is wet. This is stained. So this is something the machine is. is very difficult for it to do. Mm -hmm. So there will always be humans involved, I think. Mm -hmm. Again, Amazing. a massive labor which we as consumers are not aware of. Yeah, and also material-wise, the materials which are existing now, they don't have the same quality. The, so the question is also what happens after the sorting out. Um, so is, it, it should be sorted out, but then it's so mixed up, the fibers, how can you dismantle it? Or how, what is the way, um, yeah, the end of the fabric after the so sorting, no? And in, in addition to that, to it goes past the sorting process because a lot of these clothes do end up in landfill. And that brings a whole new element to the problem because if you see, I mean, there's not a lot of statistics of how much clothing countries like Zimbabwe import on a daily basis, but they don't end up in separate landfills. So it's not a landfill that's just clothing. It's a landfill that will be e-waste. It will be food waste. It will be plastic waste. Mm -hmm. So then if you're starting to look towards landfill, which is also a problem that we need to start addressing as an industry as a whole, and being like, okay, how can we create solutions? How can we upcycle, for example, things from landfills? Or how can we use landfills as a resource? That becomes almost impossible because it's not just the textiles and the polymers. It's also all of the extra parts from the waste ecosystem that become an issue. So then that's also something that we have to start thinking about. Um, and that makes it slightly or greatly more complex, unfortunately. And it's language too. So in Italy, for instance, or in, and in many other places, the minute something is labeled waste, it cannot be reused because it could be toxic, it could... So it, it's also a question of really reframing how we see the things that we abandon. I mean, I love working with designers, they call things found. You know, so it's no longer waste, it just, it's found. And that, you know, these linguistic um, changes of perceptions make people think and feel differently over what they're looking. I mean, I see a future of trash couture of the most exciting kind. You know, I see young designers all over the world picking, making, and looking way better than Cinderella ever did when she went to the ball. So I know that there is a, a, a creativity and an instinctive, and I go back to that instinct thing, you know, an instinctive feel of both love and intelligence when you find something, you know. It sparkles, it grabs your eye, and then you've already reprocessed it in your mind, and that's not necessarily technological, but technological could be the finding of it. Technological could be the instructions of, on how other people can do the same, and technological can be the, the selling and the spreading of it. But it does need to be linked back to a fundamental instinct. In this case, it's that of picking up, and that of mending and repairing, which we learned how to do 
just about one nanosecond after we learned how to make, mm -hmm. I'm sure we learned how to repair. Yeah. So I would like to open now the discussion a bit uh, also to our audience and maybe also to our uh, digital audience, because we have also uh, the live stream. I don't know if there came in some question over the comments online, or maybe here in our audience, do you have some questions to our panelists? Or is all clear to you? <coughs> or maybe you want to add something here in the front? Thank you so much for being here. It's an honor. Um, do you think the waste of clothing in general will be quite as much as the waste of masks? And what do you think this global mm -hmm. pandemic is teaching us as a fashion industry? Yeah. I think the waste of masks is going to be a problem. I'm kind of thinking they're so horrible. I've been thinking, why am I not walking around with a thing of fell tips so that at least I can draw on them because they're <laughs> so boring. So tomorrow I think I'm going to buy some fell tips and start drawing. That'll make me want to keep them more. But um, it's difficult to generalize with the pandemic because, I mean, for me, it's been like another Rana Plaza, you know, where humanity's shame is visible. And in this case, it's not humanity's in particular. I'm referring to fashion brands. But it has been a profoundly unequal time. And, and that, for me, has been where it's been more painful. So hopefully, uh, when it comes to clothing, it's definitely shown us that we've got way too much. Um, but when it comes to each other, I hope that it's shown us that we really need to think of each other as equals. You know, there's never been a time in which it's been, even in the same block of flats, different circumstances have hit different people. And, and so that this is, I guess, the first lesson. Really, when it comes to clothing, one interesting statistic is that when the UK reopened stores, charity shops did their best business ever. So something around this awareness did pass. Something around the we have too much or we need to keep things longer and, and sharing and swapping, something did pass, which I took as a positive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I kind of, just going off of your question too, sorry. Yep. Can we? Anyway, um, I feel like our response to masks has also very been similar to our response to clothing in terms of we've had a problem, there's a solution, which was, you know, there's virus spreading and we need to cover our faces. But we've never really thought of, from the get-go, how are we going to deal with the masks afterwards? Exactly. So we're inherently short-term thinking. Um, and that's what we do with a lot of things. We see it in politics, we see it in general policy, we see it everywhere. We think, okay, well, there's trends that we need to ch if chase, and there's, these peop there's a demand over here, and there's a demand over here, and it's very short-term. But it's not, okay, what do we do when the demand changes and the trends change, et cetera. Um, and the same with masks. We really need masks now, but hopefully in two years or a year, I wouldn't say any sooner because that's not the reality. We're not going to need masks anymore. But we didn't think of that from the beginning. So I think it's more of an indication of, okay, what are the things that we need to start thinking of from the beginning? Yep. Even if we don't have the solution, but if we'd had a centralized area where we could collect face masks from the get-go um, that are no longer being used, and then once the solution is in, we ha once we have the solution, it's mobilized. Um, and how can we do that with the fashion industry? So it's it's a similar parallel problem, where it's just that our thinking has to shift, and the way we approach problems has to shift to being less short-term and more long-term. Totally agree. <laughs> Are there any other questions? I, would I, have I see your hand raised in the back. Two, three. Oh, I would there are a lot of questions. We have to hurry up because I think we have just 10 more minutes. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah. yeah. My question was um, for the repairing platform. Uh, how exactly does it work? Because someone, a client makes an appointment, you schedule it, they 
you have workers that do the repair, they send it back, or how does it work? And what's what's like the hourly rate of that? How does it justify the, you know, it works of course with luxury garments, but fast garments, I don't understand why, how that could possibly work. So what we are trying to do, and we're really learning by doing, we are trying to standardize the repair process, which is extremely hard because every repair obviously is different and machines will never be able to repair, at least I think not until I'm alive. Um, so we have, we've been doing a lot of interviews with repair shop owners. We've been doing a lot of customer interviews. I've been repairing my stuff all my life. So we selected a number of categories which should be standardized. Like I said, we are currently testing our prototype. I was very happy. Uh, our tester said it was just as, as buying at Amazon. I was like, OK, so maybe we're moving in the right direction. So standard repairs, you would be booking it online, but then more complicated repairs, you would send a request by sending your pictures. And then we would contact uh, an appropriate repair provider. So at least in Dusseldorf, we have about 20 people who work with them. And we know this lady loves darning, and the other lo lady loves fixing jeans, and this guy loves fixing designer bags. So by this internal knowledge, we can really then contact them and then connect them with the consumer and try to facilitate the repair. In Dusseldorf, we also offer door-to-door -door delivery. So really trying to be super convenient to say, OK, you just need to click four clicks and you're going to have your, uh, your garment repaired. So we're trying to make it as easy as possible for people to buy. When it comes to prices, it's very difficult um, because um, we typically add an extra because it, the prices for repairs are very different. Every shop charges different prices, so there's no standard pricing yet. But again, uh, we're working with the industry and we're learning every day and um, yeah, still a lot to learn. Thank you. Welcome. There's one question from the online forum. <laughs> Two, but I will start with a question from Julia. She wants to know, do you see potential in augmented reality for sustainable fashion? I guess this question is uh, maybe linked to Karsten or Orsma. Do you uh, want to add something to that? The most exciting thing I've seen recently, actually, is um, virtual clothes. Yeah, And, yeah. you know, again, I go back to this technology that reminds me of when I was little and I was cutting those <laughs> paper dolls' dresses and putting them on cardboard. I mean, the idea that I could do myself virtually, do myself up completely, wear, you know, whatever, I, I find really, really interesting. And I think that if we allow the playful element of... And, and we allow our, you know, preconceptions of how to wear clothes, I mean, you know, at this point, half the time, people wear clothes to be seen in a photograph. So, bring it on. I mean, you know, the, the, so that there is an element, I think, of, of, of technology that we, that fashion can use if we focus on that, you know, playful and yeah. that yeah. element. So, I know a bit of work from, from academia that work with what's called virtual try-ons. So, that's like making a photo or video of yourself and then trying on different um, clothes virtually. I'm not sure if that's going to have a positive impact on sustainability. It might return the, the return rates of, of e-commerce, so nothing or less has been shipped back because you know better whether it suits you or not. But um, I'm a bit skeptical there. <laughs> but I think digital fashion maybe helps us to see fashion as art and less as a consumable goods. And also, I have to agree, I have an 11-year-old daughter, and she convinced me to play Roblox with her. And she said, OK, mom, let's get some outfits. And I have to be <laughs> honest, I really spent quite some money because she got an avatar for me and for herself. <laughs> and I was like, OK, that was a fun experience. Yeah. Uh, so maybe we can get this kick from, from enjoying fashion online and playing with fashion online. Um, and I think there, really, the creativity will be thriving, not the, the people who have the cheapest 
um, prices. But I think for the, you know, a case in point for the young fashion mm. open studio designers who, you know, sometimes the, we know the fashion industry is, you know, monopolized by, well, oligopolized by a few brands that have an absolute, <laughs> you know, they've invaded every single possible space, making very difficult for our cohort, for instance, to really find, you know, their customers and their audience. So I wonder for them, you know, for the more creative ones, um, the idea that they can help, they can sell something very real, very made, very beautiful, but at the same time go completely wild and bonkers and sell something that doesn't actually exist. Mm -hmm. But it is nevertheless a fruit of their design signature and their you know, creativity. In that sense, I think it's, it's interesting, but I do agree with you. I've seen a lot of stories around, you know, diminishing returns, trying on, you know, the, 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 the sampling, and I, I, I don't necessarily feel that we're there um, in, in a consistent way yet. Yeah, one more question from the audience. It's one about way. digital fashion. Is digital fashion going to slow down production or instead adding up a new product category for brands to exploit? Depends on the brands. I mean, for some brands, it will always be an addition. I mean, you know, we are seeing mainstream brands now, they will be making money from second hand. I mean, you know, that's the mentality, as, as Monica was saying. Switch the mentality and maybe it'll be, um, you know, a, a different way of experiencing fashion. But while um, business is exclusively about growth and scale, then we've got no chance. I mean, one of the things that I think I, I'm going to say it now, but Fashion Revolution does believe in a fashion industry that conserves and restores the environment and values people over profit and growth. I think with that mentality, we can start moving forward with digital, with, with all sorts. But without that mentality, then everything is going to be for the growth and the money. Yeah. So that's a good uh, ending word already, but we have two more minutes and maybe one more question to answer because I see some more hand raisings. I don't know if we make every, but maybe yeah, over there. Oh. Um, now is um, 21 century and is, it is the future, the future and, um, and, and gives it more vintage clothing and and no no high tech clothing it is and vintage clothing and some or many vintage clothing um i didn't really get the question but i think it was if it is a uh, if it's more vintage clothing in regards of new clothing? No, no, no. and um, dandy-like, dandy-like, and um, dandy-like. Okay, so I think... Um, <laughs> Perhaps if vintage clothing is the future is kind of what I understood, that we're moving away from new clothing and we're moving more towards the notion of vintage is that kind of or, or negative connotation with vintage mm. um, maybe yeah. I can speak for the recycling industry that vintage is quite interesting for them to to pick out of these this waste stream because it can be sold like like within let's say Germany at quite high prices so but there's quite an, indus uh, quite an interest in keeping these old, very specific garments. Karsten, maybe my question to you, um, because now the resale platforms are booming and more and more people are reselling clothing instead of putting them in the bin. How do you think it will affect the recycling industry? Difficult question. I think we did a bit of data science on, on second-hand platforms. And I was shocked how many new clothes there are. So different categories. They have usually 
and it was, I think, like 30% of the clothes has never been used, mm. and half of that has still the hang tag. So that is, I was shocked when I saw this. I thought it would be used clothes, but it's actually new clothes that they offer. So We just need to keep. I mean, it's not highly technological, but it's, <laughs> it's the only way easier to start. <laughs> Let's just keep things. <laughs> And I think yeah. just because we see an increase of the resale of clothing doesn't mean that there isn't a huge problem because there's still huge exportation of clothing and dumping of clothing that complements it. So if anything, the danger is that the resale, um, the resale industry or the resale market may also contribute or exacerbate that problem where more clothing is dumped because there's just an extra demand, so there's a bigger market and then it's just a never-ending cycle. So I, I don't think that we should necessarily always see there being a resale market as a positive thing because that doesn't mean that there isn't all of the negatives that surround it. It just means that we've shifted our eye away from it, um, which is also quite sad. <laughs> there was one more hand raising over there, which I saw. And then I think we have to come to the end already because our time is running. So... Yeah, please, last question. Thank you very much, dear speakers. And my question is, where do you see more potential for the fashion future in the 3D modeling and uh, digital design or in vintage, secondhand, and so on? Personally, for me, it's always a cocktail. I mean, we don't know that much about, you know, 3D, but it's always, there's never one solution. You know, we've gone way beyond the one. There's too many of us, and fashion is about individualism. So, I mean, I'll probably, you know, be printing hair clips, but not shoes, and so the rest, it'll have to be vintage for me. But we need to be able to, um, ref you know, stop ourselves from thinking that one thing will save us. Because at the end of the day, it's always a multitude of things that we can each interpret and walk through that will bring other solutions. Multiple voices, multiple people, multiple ideas. Do you want to add something? Um, yeah, just following up on what Ursula said, I just I, I completely agree. And I think that it's very contextual too. Um, for example, I think there's a lot of places where you, ca like you can expect to build different green economies by placing a 3D printer in a context where it doesn't work, um, where people don't know how to use the 3D printers, where people aren't familiar with the concept or don't necessarily want to and have their own type of innovative solutions. So again, it's one part of the problem, but I don't necessarily think it's like Ursula said, the whole solution, because I think we can also look at solutions of like indigenous knowledge systems. Exactly. Um, or decolonizing the notions of technology is a huge start to opening lots of opportunities to explore how to mitigate the effects of the industry. Um, so I definitely think there's a lot there and there could be beautiful things that come out of it, but it's not, from my context, it's not the number one focus, nor is it the number two or number three focus. Yeah, so do you want to wrap it up and uh, say some last words? Mm -hmm. Maybe when I think about the future of sustainable fashion and what could really move the needle, I think really transparency and access to information and reliable information. Because nowadays we have so much greenwashing and so many misconceptions also built by us, by the sustainable fashion community. Um, also regulation. Um, I have a lot of hope once we have stricter laws and fashion industry is forced to write down how much water the garment used and is forced to write down how you should actually recycle the garment, I think this is where we can see the change. And definitely here, technology can help because if we have transparency and if we have access to information, then it will be more and more difficult for us as consumers to turn our eye away. Yeah. True. 
Carsten, some last words, then we close the, yeah. the talk. I'm, I'm all in from the transparency because yeah. uh, I think this, what I said earlier, the, um, that there's no feedback in the system of design um, that we need to, well, well, customers need to know how long, how, so how long this product lasts and this uh, longevity, I think, is a very important thing that needs to be, well, it needs to be implemented. So. That's important to me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. It was so uh, inspiring listening to your projects, to, to the links to technology, and also um, being here with you face to face and not just digital. It was really a pleasure. Thank you so much. <laughs>